Welcome to a special edition of Living Truth, where we have traveled to Turkey and Greece. This stunning landscape of brilliant blue sea, dramatic coastline, and fertile land is the backdrop to many of the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. He sailed between these islands, walked the shores, and stood in some of the most important cities of the ancient world. Join us as Charles Price takes us into the Word of God and through the history of Paul's journeys as we walk in his footsteps. We will be inspired to strengthen our own walk with God and our intimacy with Christ. Stay with Living Truth for a message from Charles Price. Now here's a question. Why do people need idols? This message was recorded in Athens, Greece, during a retreat with Living Truth viewers on the shore of the Aegean Sea. Now, if you've got a Bible with you, I'm going to read to you from Acts 17, an account of Paul coming into this city of Athens where we are located at the moment. Acts 17, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. People have lived in this city of Athens for three and a half thousand years. Politically, Greece's greatest leader was Alexander the Great in the fourth century before Christ. Philosophically, Greece produced some of the great thinkers and philosophers of the ancient world. The names of Plato, Socrates, Pythagoras, Epicurus, Aristotle, these are all names that we're familiar with today. And it really was a remarkable, uh, perfect storm of personalities who came together at the same time and revolutionized the way people thought about life. See, Alexander the Great, when he was a boy, had a, had a tutor whose name was Aristotle. Aristotle had a friend whose name was Plato. Plato had a teacher whose name was Socrates. And they used to meet together to think. You know, they'd say, come over for a coffee and a think. <laughs> and they together became the fathers of modern thought. They set the railroad tracks, if you like, of the way we think even today in the Western world. Every morning, people have got up in this city. They've gone to work. They have come home. They've gone to bed, they've got up the next morning, unbroken for 3,500 years. It is the center, or was the center, of Greek civilization two and a half thousand years ago, and therefore the capital of the world as it was then known. Yesterday we saw the great Parthenon located on the Acropolis, which is across the Mars Hill which was the most important building of classical Greece from the 5th century BC. And when Paul came into the city, he saw some of what is still visible, what we saw when we were walking around yesterday, religiously. 
Greece was a great center of idolatry. The very name of the city of Athens is named after the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom. The Parthenon was built in her honor in the fifth century, but she was only one of many gods in Greece, as we've already seen and heard about to some extent. And so here in Acts 17 and verse 16, when Paul first came into Athens on his second missionary journey, it says, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, that's waiting for Silas and Timothy, who had left up in Berea, about 500 kilometers north of here, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. It wasn't just the goddess Athena, but a, but a multiplicity of idols in every shape, every form, for every purpose. Paul had come here through Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, and there were pockets of idolatry along the way, but now when he arrived in Athens, he was in the Las Vegas of idolatry. You know, you can see a, a slot machine over here somewhere and a slot machine over there, a little casino over here, but when you get to Las Vegas, you know, they're just everywhere. The airport is full of slot machines. You go into the hotel and the lobby is full of them. And, and Paul coming into Athens was like coming into the Las Vegas of idolatry. Now Paul makes his text in Athens the inscription of a pagan altar. Because verse 23 says, For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now, what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. You see, there was a multiplicity of gods who all had specific interests. There were gods of the weather, gods of the crops, gods of the harvest, gods of prosperity, gods of fertility, gods of power, gods of the family. But amidst all this diversity of, of idols, not all the bases were covered. They needed a God to fill the gaps. So they called him the unknown God, just in case there are any bases left unprotected. That's what lay behind them worshiping to this, uh, this unknown God. Why? Because in the heart of every human being is the knowledge I'm simply not a six foot high physical body, born one day, dead a few years later, and with no real significance. Mike Bickle has written a book called The Seven Longings of the Human Heart. I want to quote from it. He says, there are inescapable cravings in the core of every human heart that cannot be ignored or denied or pacified. They must be satisfied. When we wake up in the morning, whether we realize it or not, we're being driven by innate desires that demand answers and refuse to delay. These longings are inherent to us as human beings. We have longings, yearnings placed deep within us by God for the purpose of wooing us into his grace and presence. As we understand the origin in God, we begin to cooperate with these longings in order to find him. We find the answer to our longings is the one who put them in us in the first place. End of quote. What if we don't find God? What, what happens? Well, we create alternatives. We build substitutes. We create idols. The ancient gods that dominated Athens and Corinth and Ephesus. We've seen evidences of these on this journey. Are there because they superficially address the needs that people deep down know are there. But they only tease, they only frustrate, they only give a temporary sense, maybe this is it. And they're never satisfied. That's why they're all in ruins today. Because substitute gods come and they go. They may last 
in our lives for a few years and we become disillusioned. It may last for a few centuries in a community of people. And what keeps them going is the economic benefit they generate. When Paul in Ephesus you know, was, was, uh, w was hounded out because he preached the true God and against Artemis, it was the silversmiths who made lots of money by making these little trinkets and selling them that were the ones who were upset. Not the worshippers. And though they may give us a temporary sense, this is it. In the words of you too, we sing the same song eventually. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. We have our idols, of course, today. This is not just an antiquity. We have a multitude of idols, and we, we use the name idol for some of them. We don't for all of them. We talk about movie idols. We talk about rock idols. We talk about American idol. <laughs> the gods that we bow down to are not always obvious. They're not always external. In Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 1, Ezekiel says to the people, let me read it. It says, some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. That's not an objective, visible, physical thing. They set up idols in the heart because the heart is the manufacturing center of idolatry. It's the factory that produces idols. They're in the human heart. My dictionary defines heart in this sense a number of definitions of heart, but in this sense, it defines it as the center of thought, feeling, and emotion. The central and innermost parts of someone. And if Ezekiel is correct that idols are set up in our hearts, they begin in our thoughts, in our feelings, in our emotions, in our needs that we become aware of and try to fill in the innermost part of us. When Paul wrote the Colossians, he gave a list of vices that included these. He talked about sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. But there are idols, in the words of Ezekiel, built in the heart. You are watching a special edition of Living Truth, recorded on location in Greece and Turkey. Living Truth viewers joined Charles and Hillary Price as they traveled in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul and experienced living history. Our journey took us through Turkey and Greece. In Turkey, we visited ancient Ephesus, toured the Bosphorus River, and historic Istanbul. Istanbul, once known as Constantinople, has a strategic location straddling Europe and Asia and has attracted a variety of armies over the centuries. The Persians, Greeks, Romans, and Venetians all ruled in turn before the Ottomans finally claimed it as their own. This was the final port of call on one of the legendary silk routes linking Asia with Europe. And many of the merchants who came here liked it so much they decided to stay. In so doing, they contributed to the cultural diversity that Istanbul retains to this day. The Cathedral of Hagia Sophia was built in 6th century Constantinople under the Emperor Justinian. It's one of the most important Byzantine structures and is world-renowned due to its impressive dome and mosaic artwork. Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom in Greek. It has a complex history of ownership, particularly due to the Turkish conquest of Constantinople in the 15th century, where it was converted into a mosque. In the 1930s, it became a museum and now attracts thousands of visitors from all over the world. Sitting here on Mars Hill, I can almost hear the lively debates and disputes of the ancient scholars and philosophers as they listen to Paul's teaching. It was here that Paul gave such a wonderful address recorded in Acts 17 where he proclaimed the one true God amongst the intellectuals of the day. Paul often referred to his lack of eloquence, but the strength of his speaking came from his deep faith in the power of God at work through him. 
he was able to read the culture and explain the truth of God's words in terms they would understand, including reference to their altar to the unknown God. We can learn from his method, allowing the Holy Spirit to use what we find around us in our culture to communicate the truth to those in our lives. The Romans renamed this hill after their god Mars, but it's the Greek name Areopagus that is most renowned. This roughly translates as big piece of rock, a perfect location to teach about building your life on the rock of Christ. Throughout Greece and Turkey, our Living Truth group enjoyed traveling and worshiping together and meditating on God's Word as a community or in quiet reflection. This series was recorded on location in Turkey and Greece and is available on CD and DVD. Learn at home, give to a friend, or plan a group Bible study. To order this series, write to the address on your screen or call toll-free 1-888-269-6085. To order online, visit livingtruth.ca or simply text BUY to our toll-free number. Receive the Gospel and experience Turkey and Greece as you follow in the footsteps of Paul. We now return to our message from Charles Price. The idols of material, ambition, sexual appetite, pride, self-image, power, fame, they don't give what they're offering. They leave us disillusioned. Uh, Bill Wyman was the bass guitarist with the Rolling Stones for many years. And he said, getting the journey of getting to the top was the most exciting thing on earth. But when we got there, there was nothing there. It was empty. Someone has written, and I don't know who said it, but I noted it, saying being smart doesn't free you from the temptation of idolatry. It just gives you the opportunity to worship many idols at the same time. Many of us knock ourselves out at work to become successful, thinking that will help. But because we're smart and we know that life has to be more than work, we also try to be super mom or super dad. And because we know the kids will someday leave home, we try to save our retirement. And because we know retirement is no good if we're sick, we try to stay healthy. And we try recreation and education and the market and a bigger house and, 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 says the writer, and then says, none of these things are idols in themselves unless you expect them to save your life, which is exactly what we do expect. When Paul came into Athens, the gods were not as subtle as we make them today. They were there in marble and stone and have remained some of them for centuries. But they had the same origin in the words of Ezekiel. Men have set up idols in their hearts. Every idol tells us something about the worshiper. Paul himself, before he met Christ on the Damascus Road, his life was transformed, had his idols. His idol was essentially himself. His religiosity, of which he was extremely proud and which gave him credentials. He talks about all of this in Philippians 3. His accomplishments, his pride, his personal history. He says, you know, I wasn't just a, a, a Jew. I was a, I, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a true blue Jew. In other words, you know, I had pedigree all the way through as a Roman citizen. He talks about those things in which he delighted. He left power. He went to Damascus, you remember, to terrify and destroy Christians. The martyrdom of Stephen, where he was too young to legally throw stones, he looked after the coats and cheered them on. It made him bloodthirsty with power. Then he says in Philippians chapter 3, all of this was just garbage. Because now he says, I've found what is true. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and all these things are of no consequence. Now Paul says here in 
Athens, what you worship is something unknown. I'm going to proclaim to you. I'm going to tell you what, what it actually is that you're looking for. And I'm not going to go through the whole of his message, of course. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. And they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Notice that. Paul's message in Athens was Jesus and the resurrection. When he, be, when he wrote to the Corinthians, which is just up the road, he said to them in 1 Corinthians 1, 22, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. He said, this is my message, is Christ crucified. But when he's on Mars Hill in Athens, they don't say he is preaching the good message of Jesus crucified. They say he's preaching good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then down in verse 31, a bit later, when Paul comes to the end of his message, he says, For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he's appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So again, his conclusion, his climax is, this Jesus has been raised from the dead, and it provoked a response in the people in verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Now, I'm just pointing out to you that the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debating him debated about the resurrection. When Paul preached his message, his conclusion and climax was the resurrection. When the people sneered him, it's because he was talking about the resurrection. The resurrection is the key to Paul's message in Athens because though idols are powerful psychological forces, they are dead. They may satisfy appetites and instincts and ambitions and needs temporarily, but they cannot impart life. You cannot produce life from something dead. And the primary characteristic of an idol is that it is dead. And the primary characteristic of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is alive. That's the contrast Paul is setting up in, in Athens. The book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament, chapter 2, verse 18. Habakkuk writes this, What value is an idol since a man has carved it or an image that teaches lies? For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can I give guidance? It may be covered with gold and silver, but there is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple, and all the earth be silent before him. And Habakkuk saying, you know, what are you doing with these idols that you manufactured yourself, that you formed to meet your own interests, and they are dead and lifeless. And you say to them, wake up, do this for me, provide this for me. And they don't and they can't. You know, we cannot simply remove idols. This is important. We cannot simply remove idols. We have to replace them. If we remove an idol, we don't address the need that lies underneath the production of the idol. And so in due course, it will come back. They have to be replaced by truth and by life. And so Paul's message is, I don't actually care which idol it is that you bow down to or the multiplicity of idols you bow down to, or this unknown God designed to cover all the bases that have been left unprotected. What you need to know is there's a Jesus Christ who is alive. And the deepest needs of your heart were created by God to be met only in Christ. 
That's why Paul emphasizes the resurrection of Christ, not just as a historical event, you know, Jesus was raised from the dead in a certain time and a certain place, but as a daily relationship with a living Christ. Paul wrote in Romans 5 verse 10, if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, that's the cross of Christ, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? His death has reconciled us to God. There is a moment in our lives, if we are smart and wise, when we come to the point of saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I realize I cannot live apart from you, but you died for me that my sins might be forgiven, the barrier between myself and God might be broken down. For what purpose? Do we simply reconcile to God in terms of shaking his hand and saying, okay, we're on your side now? Know that then, having reconciled us to God, he might save us by his life. His living presence in us becomes the source and the power of our experience of God. So our greatest need is to actually know God. Not just to believe in him. You know, a creed won't do you much good. It's, it's important to have our creed. It's important we understand the doctrines of the Christian life. The doctrines can leave you cold and dead. As Paul wrote, Romans 8, verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And my own Christianity, my own experience was transformed when I realized that Christ had not only died for me, but he'd been raised from the dead to live in me. The three prepositions of the Christian life are Christ for us, but some of us don't move much beyond that. Christ in us, that's what satisfies and enables and empowers. And Christ through us as we become agents for him to work in our world. This is a special edition of Living Truth, recorded on location in Greece and Turkey. Living Truth viewers traveled to Greece and Turkey to explore and experience the Living Bible. Paul's mission throughout Greece and Turkey was fraught with challenges. Not just the physical terrain, but the spiritual weight of responsibility he carried for these fledgling churches. He might at times have questioned his survival, but his strength came from the certainty of what he had been called to do for Christ. Paul knew how to find joy in the midst of trials because he knew where his hope was found and he knew Christ's power working through him. We will have struggles in this world. Jesus promised this, but he has given us God's word, written on our hearts, so that we can live and experience abundant life during the hardest of times. In one way, our journey of faith is the same for us as it was for Paul, a journey of obedience and joy in the direction of the one who calls us. Let's continue with the message from Charles Price. And God engineers our life and circumstances to bring us to this point of realizing that we need him. Because in verse 27, Paul told the Ephesians, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. He brings us to a point where we start to reach out and maybe, I don't know everybody's story here. I don't know if everybody here is a Christian as yet. And if you're not, we're absolutely thrilled that you're here. Others of you may be Christians whose Christianity is as tedious as any other religion would be. God engineers our lives in such a way to bring us to the point of realizing apart from Him, I'm bankrupt. Sometimes we take a while getting there. And as a result, then we reach out, we seek him, he says, and we reach out for him and we find him. We only seek him, of course, because he first seeks us. Uh, Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The initiative is his, he is seeking that we in turn will seek him. And by the way, it's, it's a wonderful description to describe us as being lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. 
Do you know why it's a wonderful thing to be lost? Because to be lost is to be wanted. If you drop an empty water bottle somewhere, you've just drunk it, you put it down, you can't find it. You don't say, I've lost my water bottle. Anybody see it? Where is it? Because of little value. But if you lose your wallet, or you lose your passport, <laughs> you say, it's lost. I need it. Help me find it. Why? Because it's a value. To be described as lost is to be described as valuable. And the Lord Jesus Christ is seeking and saving us because of the value he has placed in us. And as he seeks us, he brings around that situation where we're not just passive, but where that we would seek him and reach out for him and find him. And then he says, thirdly, in verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. He's quoting one of their, pro one of, one of their poets. But he says, this is one of your poets got it right. In him we live and move and have our being. Is your Christian life characterized by living in him and enjoying fellowship with him? If you're not spending time in the word of God, I don't care how sentimental you are about the Christian life, you're not in fellowship with him because that's how he speaks to us. That's how our hearts are nurtured and warmed. If you want to turn up on a Sunday and hope I'll get a fix for the week, we're going to be very disillusioned with our Christian lives. It is time alone to be loved by him. Time alone to love him back. Time alone to hear his voice. Time alone for him to hear our voice. And I know myself, to live in the center of busy Christian ministry but to neglect intimate fellowship with God will expose you as I have experienced to unfulfilled appetites and needs that will suck us in in a way that is destructive. Whether it's egotism, materialism, eroticism, self-image, power, and these forces will chew us up and spew us out. Because we're looking for a substitute for fellowship with God himself. And Paul's last word to these people in verse 29, Therefore, since we are God's offering, we should not think the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. That God won't do you any good at all. You can set on the course to become the richest person around. It won't do you any good. In your deathbed, you won't say, wow, that was great. I'm really pleased with that. No, they say, don't they, that no one ever says in his deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. You realize, Steve Jobs, you know, I, I read uh, something that he wrote before he died. I don't have it with me, but I quoted a couple of Sundays ago. He died at the age of 56. And he said, when you're told you have only so many months to live, it focuses the mind and you find out what is really important. And many of the things I had lived for were not important. I'm paraphrasing him there. That's the gist of it. So Paul goes on to say, having said that, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. He's a very kind God. It's ignorance. It's not intentional, it's not deliberate. He overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. What does it mean to repent? The word repent in our English comes from the Greek word metanoia, which is a combination of two words, meta to change, and noia, nous the mind. It is to change your mind. Change your mind about God, change your mind about yourself, and realize that God himself alone can meet the deepest needs of our hearts. That those appetites that we seek to satisfy 
those inbuilt desires that get us out of bed in the morning to try and find that sense of fulfillment and purpose and love can only be met fully in God himself. Not just a belief, not just a creed, but daily fellowship with him, receiving him into our lives and then living in daily fellowship with him. And to repent is to face these truths about God and to embrace them and turn from my self-absorption absorption, to embrace the fullness of life that a risen, living Jesus Christ alone can give to us. Other driving forces in our lives will never be our friend. They are pseudo-substitutes. There are pleasures in sin, but only for a season. And we discover they have become poison. In Athens, in Corinth, in Ephesus, in other places we have seen crumbled idols, long lost their meaning, even though built with such precision, with such care, and with such material, many of them still standing today, thousands of years later but they're dead. They're disappointed. Only Christ will satisfy. We were made that way. It's not an optional extra, not a religious kind of sideline. We were made that way. And the appetites of our hearts can only be fully satisfied in Him. There's a hymn that expresses this wonderfully. I'm going to just read it to you. Some of you may know it. O Christ, in you my soul has found and found in you alone the peace, the joy I sought so long, the bliss till now unknown. Now none but Christ can satisfy, none other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy. Lord Jesus, found in thee. I tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, the waters failed. Even as I stooped to drink, they fled and mocked me as I wailed. Now none but Christ can satisfy. None other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy. Lord Jesus, found in thee. Is that your Jesus? Or is he simply the patron of your Christianity? Or is he your life? We're gonna to pray together. Lord Jesus, we are so deeply grateful. You did not leave us to flounder through life with the inadequate resources that we have apart from you but you came to make it possible for us to be reconciled to God and to find the deepest joys, the deepest longings, the deepest sense of significance, the deepest sense of meaning, not in a superficial happy life, sometimes in a very painful life, but deep within is the presence of God and our knowledge of God. And we say with Paul, my goal is that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection life, his indwelling presence. Make this real for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a special edition of Living Truth, recorded on location in Greece and Turkey. Living Truth viewers join Hillary and Charles Price on an unforgettable trip following in the footsteps of Paul, along with exploring biblically historic sites such as Ephesus in Turkey and Corinth in Greece. Our Living Truth travelers also enjoyed visiting the Greek islands of Santorini, Patmos, and Rhodes. Our time together included destinations such as Pergamum, 
Sardis, Pamukkale, and Cappadocia. Throughout Greece and Turkey, our Living Truth Group enjoyed traveling and worshiping together and meditating on God's Word as a community or in quiet reflection. My name is Anne Marie. My mom asked me to come on this trip with her. She was not certain she could do it on her own, so she asked me to come. And I took the gift of coming and I said, sure. I would describe this journey as unique. Uh, unique in the sense that you may come in with preconceived notions or ideas of what it's going to be and you might be completely shocked and surprised at what you end up with. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I mean that in an eye-opening, we look for unique experiences way. To walk in the footsteps of Paul, it helps me to realize that my impact needs to be where I am now. I have experienced community on this trip. It's really nice to feel welcomed and to have commonalities with people that are of all different age groups. So I like that it's intergenerational actually. It's quite nice. Never in all of my life could I plan a trip like this. I don't have the, <laughs> the organizational abilities or the care to to organize something this, this vast. And so the hotels have been great, the food has been good, this retreat is beautiful. The people have been wonderful, the leaders have made an impact, the leaders within their own countries um, that guide us have made an impact. Traveling with the Living Truth is more personal and more endearing than I ever would have imagined. I am a correctional officer that works for the Ministry of Community Services and Correctional Services. As a correctional officer, I work in a job that's not easy. It's full of a lot of stress and it takes its uh, toll on you. For me, what has kept me, it's my spirituality. I needed this trip spiritually. I feel so energized, so revived when I go back home. And just the knowledge of saying, you know, I walk there. Even when I'm reading, I can say, hey, I was right there, that's awesome. If I had to choose one word, awesome would be the word. I'm having a wonderful time, I've experienced a lot, the energy, oh my gosh, walking where, you know, the apostles have walked, experiencing what they've experienced, the feeling, all I can say is, it's wonderful. This is a special edition of Living Truth, recorded on location in Greece and Turkey. Join Living Truth as we travel by luxury coach to beautiful Lancaster, Pennsylvania. From May 8th to the 11th, 2017. Your wonderful adventure includes a guided sightseeing tour through Amish country, a ski train ride, a visit to historical Hershey, Pennsylvania, and more. Your visit to Lancaster also includes a live performance of the epic adventure Jonah at the renowned Sight and Sound Theater. The classic Bible story of Jonah springs to life on stage in jaw-dropping scale with spectacular special effects and live animals. You'll also enjoy three nights at the beautiful Eden Resort Hotel. Contact us early to reserve your ticket. Call Christian Journeys at 1-877-465-3442 or visit online. Be a part of this wonderful Living Truth experience. See you in Lancaster. We enjoyed a rejuvenating two-day respite with Charles and Hillary Price, where they shared insightful biblical teaching. We chatted with Charles Price. We got yesterday to, uh, to spend some time at the Pantheon and Mars Hill, and you've had the opportunity to unpack a little bit of Acts 17 and Paul's message there at the Areopagus and uh, I wonder if we can just explore the subject of idols for just for a little bit as we think about idols of, of the Greek the ancient Greek culture and then idols within our own culture and our own environments and you know we often think about things like like money and ambition and sex and you know whatever it might be and one of the things that's intriguing to me is that none of those things in themselves are bad things. 
And idols, of course, we have a, a, a connotation that they represent negative things in our, in our lives. And of course, they can. But as we think about in our culture, those aspects of money, etc., those kinds of idols, where do they become idols and where are they passions and how do we navigate our way through that? Can you just talk sure. about that a little for us? These idols exist because they represent a need in, in, in the human psyche where we're made. So Aphrodite, for instance, in Corinth, where it became a big sexual orgy, you know, a thousand prostitutes, we were told, used to work there and help people participate in worship. What they were searching for is intimacy. Now, sexual intimacy is a physical manifestation of a much deeper intimacy that we're designed to enjoy with God. Because a person can have a, a good sex life and be totally empty as far as what is it really all about. And I think a lot of the physical uh, things in our lives have behind them something that is deeper, that is not obvious to us initially. It only becomes obvious if we're honest when we realize this does not satisfy me. So money, we need money. But it can become so much more than a, a means of simply uh, uh, buying and selling goods. It can become the master. And you know it's a master when you begin to break the rules uh, with it. You begin to cheat. You begin to deceive. Um, then you know this is not a servant anymore. This, is, this has become a master. And I think Ezekiel's statement, which he repeats five times, uh, to people say, you've built idols in your heart. The, the context of this is that Ezekiel was in exile, and when the Israelites were taken away into exile, they did leave behind, and we never see again in Israel, the gods of Baal, the Ashtaroth poles, and so on. And, and to some extent, all the outward formal idolatry of Israel was cleaned up. You come into the New Testament, they came back from exile, several hundred years later, of course, Christ came, 400 years later, and uh, you don't find that kind of idolatry in Israel at all. So Ezekiel is saying to the people, you may have cleaned the land of idols. There may be no stones and rocks and poles and trees that you go and worship anymore, but they're in your heart. And that makes them much more subtle, much more deceptive. If I see a man go down the road and, and offer a, a, a lamb to a stone statue, which I have seen in India, mm. you think that, that guy is in that case, you know? What, what do you think he's getting out of that? If we don't create physical gods, but they are gods in the hearts, they drive us and we don't recognize them even. Just think about our families for a moment. At, at what point can something like our families, which is such a positive thing in our lives, and of course prioritizing our families and the children and parents and etc., where is that line that something like even a family can become an idol? How, how does that work? Where is that, where is that tipping point for us? I think when you start to manipulate your family to accomplish your own ends, I think you can do that in marriage. Uh, a man can use his wife rather than serve her and love her, but use her and eventually abuse her in whatever form that is. Uh, and vice versa, women can manipulate their husbands and so on. I think when you get that situation, they are no longer loving and serving. They are using and exploiting. And I think that is what lies at the heart of idolatry, that you are the key to something in my life. And if you're the key, I'm going to make that key work. The, the key to what's really important, what really matters in life, is Christ himself, resident in our hearts, living in that daily fellowship with him. Because when you experience that, it doesn't actually matter what your circumstances are. So we went to Patmos on this journey, and John was, uh, w was shut away there, imprisoned, uh, not able to leave the island. That was the nature of his imprisonment, it mm. seems. Not put in a cell, but there's nobody there, or very few people there, it's a small island. And uh, while he's there, he, he gets this amazing vision of God that became the book of Revelation. And uh, this amazing sense uh, of, of saying that, that uh, his love and his blood alone are what 
uh, meet the deep needs of their hearts. And I never thought of before, by the way, huh. the end of Revelation, he says, there'll be no more sea. And uh, I've heard people try to explain, why there'll be no more sea? What, what, what does it mean that? I was, what do you mean? I won't be locked in anymore. Because the sea was his, mm. was his prison wall. So I, I think, you know, Paul says, I've learned uh, that whatever state I am to be content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things. Why? Because Christ is my strength. Mm. So what happens to me is very secondary to what happens in me. I'm hoping there's going to be sea in heaven by the way, because this to me is uh, as close to heaven as I've ever been. Let me just pursue that a little, a little more for a second. What, what does it look like in these areas of our lives? As we've, you know, we've talked about money and family and sex and, and all of these aspects. What does it look like to, to really welcome Christ into those places? Where does that, because we're, we're talking about replacing idols in our lives. With, with Christ. But really on a lot of levels as we're, we're looking into these areas which, you know, as we've said, in and of themselves are not negative things. They can become that if, if they lose their, their rightful place in our lives. So just talk for a little bit about what that looks like in, in a healthy way. Well, first of all, we're constantly being uh, drawn away from the centrality of Christ. Like, it's like a centrifugal force that is pulling us all the time. You see it in the history of the Christian church. Mm. You know, there's a great new movement and, and, and uh, you see God at work and, and before long it's become dead. No one ever started a dead church, but there are thousands of them around because they were once dead alive marriage. and then moved away. Dead marriage, dead everything. And I think, you know, I know in my own life the guards I have to have up and I know the places where I've learned this through pain mm. and, and, and uh, suffering, even ministry, you talk about these things being good, can become your idol in the sense that it's what drives you. And so I've got to do the next thing, I've got to get rid of the next thing, which you do. But your heart becomes dry and barren, and those needs of the heart will seek fulfillment in other things. Mm. And you'll feel, well, I need some downtime anyway. Uh, but, but you gravitate something is not good, something is not healthy, something is not wholesome. And that can be manifest in, in, in a whole variety of ways. Um, it can be egotistical, it can be sexual. There's a whole variety of ways in which, uh, wrapped up in good things, you, you've allowed a, a vacuum to develop in, in your heart. It's like in a marriage. You can be married, you can live together, you can engage in all the aspects of marital life. But if you're not looking into each other's eye, if you're not feeding each other's soul, if you're not being fed by each other's love, you'll become dissatisfied in your marriage. And we're very quick, I think, in the Christian life often to look for zap experiences where I want to fix this, boom, there it is, it's done. There's very little that's like that. That's my experience and my observation of scripture as well. Um, again, going back to marriage, there's a wedding day, bam, zap, you know, it's over. I mean, it's done, but that's not the marriage. No. Now, I often say to people when I conduct weddings, so I don't do very often, but when I do, I've, I've on a number of occasions talked about togetherness. And I've said there are two kinds of togetherness in marriage. There's a side-by-side -side togetherness, where you're moving together, you've got the same sense of direction, you share goals, you share vision for your lives together. And there's a face-to-face -to -face togetherness. The side-by-side -side togetherness, other people can join you, right. children, right. family, sure. colleagues. Face-to-face -to -face togetherness, nobody else is part of that. And uh, that is also true in our Christian life. Thanks for chatting through uh, some of these things. I think it's a lot of fun. Let me ask you another question. You know, as we, as we think about where this trip is going to go and, and some of the opportunities we have going forward, what, what, do, you, what do you still think is going to This series was recorded on location in Turkey and Greece and is available on CD and DVD. Learn at home, give to a friend, or plan a group Bible study. To order this series, write to the address on your screen or call toll-free 1-888-269-1111.
6085. To order online, visit livingtruth.ca or simply text BUY to our toll-free number. Receive the Gospel and experience Turkey and Greece as you follow in the footsteps of Paul. To walk in the footsteps of someone is to follow where they went, to be inspired by their life, and to want to continue the work they began. Paul's journey through Greece and Turkey should be an incredible inspiration to us all. He never lost sight of the mission before him and the urgency to spread the gospel, and all motivated by his profound relationship with Christ. A journey can be defined as progressing from one stage to another, and although we may not literally follow in Paul's path, hopefully we will always make spiritual progress on our walk. To follow Christ wherever he leads, to dig deeper into his word, and to see our lives and relationships with him transformed because of it. Now that's true progress. I'm Jared Earhart. Join us next time for more Living Truth.